Our and next session is on uh, productionizing AI, AI from prototype to production. Has Our speaker has been nominated <coughs> making it faster uh, in the Global Power Data Woman and is under 40 and data leaders. Right? Uh, she conscious. strategizes and executes data and AI solutions for Brillo and she runs the AI uh, Brillo's AI labs. Made. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for Mutumari S. Not only benefits businesses, but also ushers in a Hello, hi everyone. I am Mutu and I lead the data science and AI for Brilio. Um, like uh, they mentioned in the introduction, I've been solutioning and uh, doing a lot of workshops with customers across the globe. And I'm sure since morning you have already heard a lot about uh, you know, AI and AI related topics, security related topics. So here I'm just going to um, you know, talk a little bit about uh, what is what is AI strategy? How do you define an MVP and uh, how, do you, how can you go to production? And I'm going to share a little bit of uh, the learnings I have had uh, working with you know, different customers. So um, the one thing that has happened while I have been in this industry for more than a decade now, uh, over the last one year, it's just amazing to see the kind of adoption in my own family, right? Starting from my kid who talks about uh, gamer behavior and, uh, you know, gaming AI in his, you know, Xbox and PlayStation to my uh, parents, uh, you know, discussing to me about deep fake and talking about uh, what is happening in the news channels. So that way I'm very happy that uh, I don't have to explain to them what I do for a living, which used to be the case, uh, you know, a decade back when I used to, you know, explain what is analytics, what is data science, and today, at least, you know, that part I'm very happy. But um, now coming to, you know, the hype right now, everybody wants to have an AI strategy, everybody wants to uh, build use cases, everybody wants to create a roadmap. Um, now, if you have to, you know, start from scratch, and uh, if you want to go from where you are from a data adoption perspective, analytics adoption perspective, to look at what is AI and how different is it going to be. There's going to be a lot of similarities, but there are some subtle differences also that uh, I'm just going to talk about. Now, if you look at this, the problem-solving approach, right? Everything starts with, why am I doing this? What is the problem that I'm you know, trying to solve? And does it really need AI to solve or does it need generative AI? Now, that line is also blurring as I was just, you know, talking with another, you know, friend a bit, uh, <coughs> sorry, during the lunch that a lot of people think AI and Gen AI are same, right? AI is, you know, a little different from Gen AI. Gen AI is where we are utilizing, you know, data to generate new content, but, you know, it's just a section within the AI uh, industry. Now, coming back to the problem-solving approach, we start with data, right? Now, there are a lot of problems that, uh, you know, we could solve using AI, but if we have to fine-tune it and look at what is relevant to me and my problem, we'll have to check whether we have the right kind of data available and whether the data is available in the right granularity. For example, um, if we are creating an AI strategy for, like, say, a QSR, a quick service restaurant like a KFC or a McDonald's, and uh, you want to forecast at every hour what is going to be the kind of orders that I'm going to get. Now, if your data is not available at hourly level, and if your data is only consolidated at a daily level, then you're not going to be able to solve this using, you know, whatever data that is available. So that is, you know, the fundamentals of what exactly you will be able to do. The other part, of course, insights and model, you know, we all know there are multiple different, you know, models that are available, libraries available for us to, you know, utilize. Then comes the consumption, right? How am I going to consume it? And what is going to be the adoption? How am I going to adopt it? Now, for example, you know, you build very amazing, you know, dashboards forecasting um, how the SKUs are going to be, what, what burgers people are going to buy. But if that's available in a very complicated system that a restaurant manager cannot, you know, look at, or if he's not able to understand or take decisions, that is going to be a, a very difficult, you know, from a consumption and adoption perspective. So it's very important for us to think through how am I going to consume and what format. Now, 
uh, I have seen my team, you know, create very sophisticated models with MAPE and, uh, you know, different iterations. If you use hierarchical forecasting, this is the MAPE, and if you use a different model, this is going to be the accuracy, right? All those information is not relevant to the persona who is going to be consuming your models. So that is where, you know, the human element and the adoption, again, becomes very, very relevant, and it's important for us to design solutions that are simple, and that you can adopt and consume with less cost involved in that whole strategy. Then comes your uh, foundation, incubate, accelerate, and scale. Now, you have you know, con consolidated the use case that you want to develop, and uh, you have decided to you know, start working on it. Then what happens, right? Now, we do something called a discovery uh, exercise. In the discovery exercise, which can go from you know, one week to a maximum of four weeks, depending on the complexity, you will be going a little deeper to understand and start mapping some of these uh, you know, things that we spoke about. When we say data, like I mentioned about granularity, right? You, sh you will also start looking at the governance. You will also start looking at what is the quality of data that is available? Do I have enough governance and observability in place for me to do this use case? Because tomorrow, if, uh, say, you keep getting forecasts that I'm going to you know, uh, sell 100 burgers in every hour, while uh, until yesterday you were selling up to 10 burgers per hour. Now, this could be a data quality issue, or this could be a seasonality issue, or this could be you know, a, a genuine trend that is going to happen tomorrow. Now, unless you have the right level of data observability or tracking in place, you're not going to be able to go back and see why this number is happening and how you will be able to correct it, which is where discovery exercise becomes very, very important for us to start mapping what is possible, what is not possible, what is available, and are we even ready to do something like this. Then comes your you know, demystify, then science. In science, this is also becoming very important, especially in today's world, because you have a lot of foundational models already available. Not all the time you need to you know, start building your own model. You can you know, uh, understand what is the difference between prompt engineering, RAG, and fine tuning. And it's important for us to take that decision in your second box, which is you know, the science box. And the third one, which is the engineering. This is another uh, thing that started blurring a couple of years back, right? Now, data scientists cannot say that I will only build the model and I'm going to ask somebody else to scale, because it's important for you to keep the engineering mindset as a core when you design solutions. Because the cost of building a new iteration or the cost of having an additional model in your production is very, very important, and every decision you take in the science box is going to affect your whole you know, scaling the architecture part, because every small decision, whether you're going to prompt engineer, whether you're going to use RAG, whether you're going to use fine tuning, whether you're going to use open AI or open source, every small decision you're going to take in the science layer is going to affect your uh, cost of scaling. The next part becomes the outcome, which is, again, very, very critical. When you start a project, it's very important for us to understand how am I going to measure the outcome of this project, right? Because um, if you see, while everybody talks about cloud adoption, I think uh, whoever is following AWS reInvent would have seen the facts that uh, they've been talking about, right? A lot of large enterprises have not migrated even 20% of your data to cloud. They are still using a combination approach of keeping on-prem and you know, uh, data on cloud as well. Now, how can we avoid this whole situation happening for the AI transformation is to start looking at the outcomes that we want to derive and look at what data I want to move into cloud. Because when you look at AI and generative, generative AI scaling, it's important that you know, you know what the infrastructure is going to be and how am I going to derive the outcomes. The outcomes can be resilience, it can be experience, like I said, it can be adoption, because a lot of customers you know, I have worked with have created chatbots, but people barely use it because they feel that anyway, chatbot is going to you know, redirect me to a human, so I might as well you know, call the customer care. Then comes TRISM, which you know, the last few sessions have been about uh, risk and security. So of course, TRISM becomes very important, and efficiency. 
Again, lots and lots of articles and talks that have been going on on the production efficiency. Is AI going to take my job? So again, efficiency becomes you know very important to measure because now even if we talk about productivity gains in our ecosystem, while we use co-pilots, a lot of organizations are struggling to put a number to it and say, okay, now that I have co-pilot. I can safely, you know, uh, reduce 2024 uh, cost of development by this percentage, or can I remove 20% of my workforce? No, that is not going to happen, right? So, which is why you need to define what do I mean by efficiency, and how am I going to uh, measure it? For example, the, the same use case that I spoke about, the QSR and uh, forecasting the burgers, right? Now, what is my final outcome? Why am I doing this forecasting model? Is it to ensure that I'm able to deliver to the customers on time by being ready with the burgers uh, one hour before? Or is it that I'm trying to improve my customer experience by uh, delivering it you know, before time or giving them the right price? Or is it efficiency by uh, you know, looking at my workforce, optimizing based on how my forecasts are going to be, right? So it's very important for every use case to have the right level of outcomes and how are we going to measure it based on our data. Now this is the discovery part that I was talking about. This is a framework that I had built for some of our customers, right? So when you start building an AI strategy, the first step, like I said, is to understand how ready uh, you know, I am as an organization to build this use case. Now for generative AI, it's very similar, but it's going to be a little more complicated because it's the data that is getting generated, so you will have to look at regulations, whether you can price the customer. Say, for example, I was working with a font company which was using generative AI to create fonts. Now, there is a new regulation that says that if the, if the fonts are generated by AI, then you, can, you cannot actually own the copyright for the content that got created, right? So these are some of the nuances that we will have to check before um, you know we start a AI use case. So th this is like strategy which I was talking about, right? Vision, principles, what's the maturity level? Should I buy or build? Because there are a lot of products in the market. So why do you know start something from scratch when something is already available? Um, Trism, which was which you know I'm sure all of you have heard enough since morning about the cybersecurity risk and uh, you know everything else that comes with the governance, data observability, which is the very, very, you know, the biggest pillar of uh, you know, any AI use case to be successful or uh, fail. Fourth one, again, is very, very important, which I think will be the biggest topic of discussion in 2024 and 2025. Because if you see this year, a lot of companies and organizations are still in MVP. They are still exploring, they are still reacting to the FOMO of generative AI and AI by building MVPs, showing some quick wins. But ops is something that is going to be a game changer. Let us take banks, for example. Now, um, the way we look at you know, other sectors, the way we will be looking at a data drift, model drift, concept drift, how am I measuring my hallucinations, all of these will have a very, very different impact from vertical to vertical. Now, if you're looking at banks and healthcare, most of the organizations that I've worked with want real-time uh, you know, access to understanding what is happening you know, on the hallucination, what is happening on the drift, what is happening on you know, concept drift. So this is going to become a very, very important factor. And cost is another big factor that everybody wants to monitor on a regular basis because you know, when you start from MVP, you, are, you still have things under control because you are doing it in a very controlled environment. You have just a, a subset of the data that you're dealing with. But when you go to production, there's going to be more data generated. You're going to generate data from the AI product that you are creating. You're going to have more analytics from your conversational AI products. So the data is going to be huge. And the cost is also going to be huge. So how are you going to manage that? How are you going to manage the new security risks that are going to you know, keep coming up? right? So, those are some of the aspects that we address in the fourth pillar, which is the ops, which I think will be very important in the next uh, couple of years. And fifth one is the adoption, which we already discussed. So this is like the, the formula that you know I came up with for the MVP, right? The minimum viable AI product. 
So this is the first stage that we all are in. Lot of products that we have seen, it, it starts with very minimal features which we can test with our audience, which we can see whether um, you know, we can validate the learnings with the least effort without having to put more um, you know, effort and cost. MVPs typically we try to deliver in 12 to 14 weeks maximum, um, but there are MVPs that we've delivered in seven to eight weeks as well. Now, primarily it is targeted as cost efficiency like, like I was talking about because um, we have something called cost estimator where we look at what is it costing now in MVP and what is it going to cost you in production when you have like the huge volume of data that's going to come in. And, uh, and also iterative development, right? Now, even if everything goes well and then you go from MVP, MVP to production, there's going to be a lot of iterations that you will be developing. Uh, there'll be new features that you'll always be coming up with. There'll always be new algorithms that you might want to you know, um, get added to your model tournament. So this whole iterative development approach, how am I going to build and design the architecture in such a way that um, I'm able to you know, come up with something that I can add anything, any module very quickly without having to go through a lot of changes. Then comes your user level engagement, right? Now we can say, okay, my product was so cool, it is very successful, but unless you go back to the outcome, unless you're able to prove value, it, it does not make sense for us to go to production. So this is like a you know, simple formula that uh, I created for scale. Now, when you go from um, you know, MVP to production, like I said, operational and environmental cost, is going to mount very high and every small decision that you take during your design process is going to cost you in millions uh, during the production. The second one is of course the inference acceleration, right? So uh, what type of models are you going to use for which use case? There are uh, cases where you can have multiple pipelines. Like I'm not against adopting generative AI, but there are still problems that you can solve using Intent-based conversational AI, you can build simple chatbots with normal FAQs. You don't need generative AI for and LLM models for all the use cases. So it's important for us to you know, build parallel pipelines and create cost-conscious architecture where you come in and just you know, um, look at what makes sense and then you, you know, trigger the pipelines accordingly. Of course, hallucinations, bias, privacy, as in, there is a lot of uh, you know, confusion on responsible AI, privacy preserving al algorithms, federated learning. Now we have another added concern on hallucination. But the good news is there are a lot of uh, libraries available today to evaluate hallucination and to fix it. Um, the one that I have uh, you know, personally you know, tried and tested is to look at you know, the data, we build models based on the external data available and you keep comparing it with the data and the uh, results that are coming in. And it's also important for us to see how and what kind of data we are using to um, build the model and fine tune it in itself, right? Because if your inherent data that you're using for fine tuning itself has bias, then your final uh, you know, generative AI is also going to be tuned that way. So it's important for us to look at our data layer and also look at how uh, we are going to take care of this in production. Then, of course, you know, robust infrastructure. I have worked with customers who still don't have MLOps, who still don't have basic infrastructure in cloud, but they want to use generative AI, right? This is a model for failure, and this is also important for us to look at. There is another a uh, customer who is still in on-prem and they have like tons and tons of data but they don't have you know um, enough infrastructure for us to you know build generative AI models or fine-tune right so now the cost of GPUs are going to be very high so am I going to take a sample data from on-prem to do it is something that we have to take a call during the MVP stage. The next comes the value quantification and lack of maintenance right this is what I was talking about where you build something and you go to production, the most important team that is going to be valuable is going to be the ops team, the, the traditional DevOps team who's going to do the LLM ops in the next coming years. Then the last one is organizational culture and uh, talent scaling. This is another uh, very, very important aspect because a lot of uh, organizations still don't have the right kind of AI talent. 
Now, which is okay, but uh, how are we going to build that internally? How are, what kind of talent are we going to hire from the market? So th these are like very important strategies to build. Like for example, within you know my own organization, we are looking at how many employees should be you know um, developers, Gen AI developers, AI developers. How many of them should just learn prompt engineering? How many of them should know what is AI? And how many of them should understand where to adopt, how to adopt, what to talk, right? So there are different levels of trainings, there are different levels of adoption and culture that will be required within every organization, whether you're making AI products or you're somebody who is buying AI products. So that is another very, very important part. Now this formula is just a summary of what I spoke about, which is a combination of data and infra management model, where you, want, you are going to you know, understand whether you're going to use whatever is already available in the market. Are you going to fine tune? Are you going to prompt engineer? Are you going to use RAG approach? Then comes your XAI. XAI is nothing but the explainability component of the models. Then your governance, right? Governance again has ethical, regulatory compliances, and audit. This data audit, code audit, and model audit is very, very important when it comes to the governance. Then comes your stability. Once I finish everything, I go to production, then how am I going to ensure and monitor the stability of the products that are in production? Where you will look at model monitoring, hallucination monitoring, value monitoring, and cost monitoring. Now, all of this will have to be you know, uh, looked at from ops perspective and application-centric uh, model perspective, because any model that you take, now, I'll just take a minute to talk about this application-centric, right? Now, any product that uh, you know, we build using AI or generative AI, it's not like before, where I just stop with my report, I just create a dashboard, and then I'm done with the project, right? Today, all of this is getting integrated with the application. And all of this is getting into you know, some integration issues. There are a lot of existing products where you're trying to add an AI layer on top of it. Now, this becomes super important for us to also bring in the whole product engineering mindset and look at it from that perspective as well. Um, the other perspective on the feedback loop is um, we typically, whatever MVP that we generate, we create the reinforcement learning algorithms where you get very simple feedback, like even if customer doesn't write like long feedbacks about the responses generated by bots, just a simple thumbs up, thumbs down, right? This in itself is very easy for us to understand whether you know your containment rate is good, bad, ugly. So then, of course, is the vertical and horizontal. So this is my exponential uh, factor because if you're not curating your solutions and products according to the, uh, you know, the vertical. For example, when I say vertical, I'm talking about banks, or whether it is going to be a healthcare, or whether it's going to be a drug discovery process, or a QSR, and also horizontal. Is it for marketing? Is it for supply chain? So all small, small elements are going to have very different types of regulations available at every geography. So it's important for us to take that into consideration, and that becomes your exponential factor. So thank you. I think I overread the time, but uh, thank you so much for this opportunity. I think the fact that you got claps without me asking says it all. Right? Very insightful session there. Thank you for that journey from concept to MVP to the actual ops part. Very insightful there. Yeah. Can I call upon stage Mr. Sachin Maske from NASCOM to felicitate Ms. Muthu? Thank you. Thank you.